my name is Christian Frost. I'm an academic and architect um, who um, spent many years um, looking at Salisbury. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about that research and how um, that research has helped me understand certain aspects of the medieval period, but also as an architect researcher, I'm also interested in today. I'm not a historian, purely, uh, although history forms a major part of my research. And it's this relationship between history and architecture and the present and finding ways in which history can influence the present, I think that sort of underpins my own uh, interest in the subject. So I'm going to be uh, using several articles and books that, 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 that I've written over the, uh, over the years to sort of as a, as a sort of a background uh, for the talk. And obviously those things are all um, available. Um, so the first piece is the Wiltshire Studies um, article that I wrote in 2005, which is about this, what I considered at the time to be an unwritten history of the symbolic move to, um, from Old Sarum to Salisbury, that at the time in the 13th century, the people who were interested in moving the city were really um, thinking about it as much symbolically as much as politically, albeit they were all a part of a, of a of horizon. And in that, in that particular study, I translated a uh, previously untranslated letter that had been written in around uh, the turn of the century, around 12, 1206, by uh, Peter de Blois, who uh, was a Norman. And he, he, he writes um, about certain aspects of the city. And in, in that particular piece, I compare it to the Psalms, some of the Psalms. And also then also, uh, the, the second piece I, I, I use in that particular this is a, it's a poem that was written about the same time as the initial consecration of the, um, of the uh, east end of the cathedral. That was written by um, Henri d'Avranche, who was effectively the, the, um, the court poet of the period. So those two sort of written pieces talk about the sort of symbolic nature of the city move. Um, and that formed a part of the research that led to my, my, my main piece that I did, which was called Time, Space and Order, the Making of Medieval Salisbury. That came out in 2009. And that's a pretty comprehensive study. It sort of m m most of the stuff we're going to talk about today is in that book. And you can you can you can see most of the drawings, the photographs and much uh, more in-depth arguments relating to the history, uh, the documentation that I used um, and the way in which I, I sort of think that the whole city was was, was put together. Um, the third document we're going to talk about a little bit is, uh, less so, but it's important part of this um, uh, trajectory of this particular talk, is a, is a piece I wrote in the uh, International Journal of Heritage and Sustainable Development. And that talks about some of the developments that have happened since the completion and why this sort of symbolic sort of translate that into a poetic understanding of Salisbury is an important way of trying to see how one could uh, open up new avenues for future development, future ways of seeing the city built upon this extraordinary history that I'll talk something about today. And then the final um, piece is, uh, is in the Journal of Urban Culture Studies and that's, that's a study I've done more recently on Florence, uh, which forms a sort of second part of my uh, my research trajectory, if you like, um, because what happened in Salisbury is that during the 13th century, um, the religious order of the city uh, allowed its allowed um, for the control of the urban environment within this sort of symbolic understanding to allow. Uh, the processions, of which there were many in Salisbury, something like 120 processions a year at the time, allowed some of those processions to come out into the city and frame um, the, the, the urban landscape in a, in a, in a, in a symbolic way, um, pretty much determined by the bishop and his chapter. Of course, during the 13th century, across Europe, particularly in northern Italy and more moving into the, uh, the 14th century, um, there emerged a new type of city, the city commune, um, which is a critical part of the uh, development of the European city. And it's 
perhaps no surprise that we'll find that many of the uh, uh, pr processional developments that happened in Salisbury precursor or are precursors to um, uh, to these later developments, and many of those still survive, albeit they've been uh, resurrected at pre various times in history. There's always been uh, within memory. Uh, a, a procession or something, a festival going on. They're not invented out of nothing. They've become more regular, particularly since the 1930s in Italy, but they had been present uh, through the lifetime of many other people, although maybe not celebrated annually. Of course, in the UK, uh, particularly in England, the Reformation cut a swathe through all of the types of uh, representations that were considered papistic. And so much of this landscape, much of the ceremonial landscape of the church, even if it had been transformed to, to some extent civ into civic representation at the time, were, were, were stopped um, and banned in many cases across the country. We have some, some uh, areas survive. There's, there's um, certain um, processions in, in the north of England. I think in Chester there are some. York had some until a bit later. But most of them, and Salisbury is no exception in this, most of them were lost. And of course, along with the losing of the processions, you lose something of the meaning of the architecture itself. The architecture, in a sense, is a part of that framework, that fabric framework. And so the, the four studies that, I've, that I'm going to be looking at uh, today will begin to sort of think about that sort of overall arch and maybe try and bring us back by the end of the talk to something that's about uh, today. So one of the critical things that's really important to understand first of all about Salisbury is that it's almost unique in Europe. Um, most European cities grew and developed um, and became layers of new development on existing structures. And that meant that, that there was a certain restriction in what any new bishop or any new uh, civic leader could do to the, to the shape of the city. Now in Salisbury, of course, we have this extraordinary uh, occurrence in the beginning of the 13th century. Um, the whole city moved from another site to the site here. And so it offers almost a, a unique experience of asking a question, well, if a church bishop, important bishop, um, Bishop Poor at the time was a, was a, was a relatively significant uh, bishop and very close to the Archbishop of Can uh, Canterbury, who had been his, his tutor in, in his uh, studies in Paris, Stephen Langton, uh, this relationship, what, what could they do to a landscape given carte blanche, given the fact that there is nothing there in the landscape. Maybe there was a, a church, but, but most of the landscape was free and they could do anything they wanted. And this is the most extraordinary thing. So it allows us a little bit of a window into the mind of the medieval um, bishop uh, who, who's, who has the opportunity to make a new cathedral and city in a way that maybe many other places don't. But of course, this this slide uh, of um, uh, Old Sarum, the model of Old Sarum that sits um, various places uh, in, in the cathedral. This is when it uh, when it was situated in the in the cloister. It's a remarkable landscape setting, uh, as is much of the landscape around Salisbury. Um, and when I first came across this in uh, the, the late 20th century, right at the end of the 20th century, I came across this model. I didn't really know much about Salisbury at all and became curious as to where it was. You know, I'd, I'd come to see the cathedral and, this, and the city like most people, and but actually had no idea at that time about this old site, this old setting. And so, um, in a sense for me, this is the beginning of the journey as well. It was the curiosity that I had. Why did they move from here? What actually am I looking at uh, in this model with the castle in the centre? You can see the cathedral, the old uh, St Osmond's Cathedral over to, 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 the, to the right there in the, in the back. Um, and I became extremely curious about why they'd moved. The cathedral at the time was probably only 150 years old. This is, this is young. It, it takes 50 to 60 years to build a cathedral. This is a young cathedral. Why would they decide on such a, an extraordinary move? And in the book, uh, I, I talk about the reasons 
why that happened. And, and um, I'm not going to go into that in great in, into great detail now. It would suffice it to say that the the king and the bishop didn't get on for a number of reasons, and the bishop then decided to move the city onto his own land, slightly to the south of the cathedral uh, of the existing old Serum. So on this slide here, you can see the site plan, um, which shows Old Serum and to the south, uh, the, the area uh, where we have okay, some, some uh, Bishop's Mill and St. Martin's Old Town. That's around about where, um, where the new city was placed in, the, in this uh, bend of the, river, of the River Avon. And this land was all owned by the bishop, and so any market tithes, any trading done in the city and of course Salisbury went on to become one of the wealthiest cities in the region because of its um, fantastic trade links um, it, it meant that all of those revenues went to the went to the church but then what I became really interested in is well, what did they do given given this carte blanche given this completely empty landscape what did they do how did they go about structuring it and in the end, I sort of began to develop a, a, a few particular um, strategies for trying to understand it. And the first one was that the bishop, having um, got very angry with the king, um, had decided to build this new cathedral with a close. And he wanted his new close to be approximately the same area as the old, old serum had been. So if you can see on this... Uh, on this drawing here, this square with the with the uh, with the diagonals in it, it, sort of encompasses the whole of Old Serum, and that pretty much, uh, if you shift that down to the new site, it gives you the dimensions approximately of the new uh, of of the new close. Uh, and so, whereas at Old Serum the centre had been the castle, here in the south, in this new move, the centre was the cloister, and that's that's significant, I think. It's not the bishop's palace. It's not the bishop taking over from the king. It's not the cathedral. It's the cloister. And what the cloister is, is symbolically a representation of nature. It's a symbolic Garden of Eden. And so what he's doing is shifting um, the land from or the, the, the setting of the city, which had its centre on, on, uh, on royal rule, to, to a place where it's centred on uh, the, the idea of a, a, roof, a, a symbolically redefined or reified uh, natural order. Um, and then if you sort of approximately uh, draw a line from Old Serum to, uh, to, to, to Salisbury, um, you get these two dotted lines that I have on, on, on this drawing. Now, the surveying accuracy at the time was around about um, one degree. So that gives you a, a, a sense, the, the dotted line, the little the mini dots and the dotted line give you a sense of what sort of accuracy. And looking at the, bottom, the image on the bottom left, you can see um, that the, the old serum would have been visible from, um, from the city. Uh, from the city on its on its new lower ground down down by the riverbank, and so the notion of setting up this orientation was was absolutely feasible. And this, of course, was the ground, and you can see the the road, the dotted line to the right there, um, pretty much follows the old north south road uh, down coming into into the city, uh, and that's this that's the road along which they would have taken not only um, some of the stones, although many of the stones. That they used to build the um, the close walls came at a much later date, and so uh, as you'll see, some of the images later seem to depict a timber boundary to the close timber timber wall. Uh, some of the stones, and certainly um, certainly the bishops' remains, uh, the the early bishops' remains, were brought along this this line in a solemn procession uh, once the initial uh, chapel had been consecrated in around the mid twelve uh, twenties. So one of the things that intrigued me initially was this gridiron plan, this gridded section to the bottom, which is often used by medieval um, uh, geographers, geographers of the medieval, uh, who study medieval period, as a sort of uh, approaching an ideal plan for a city. And this, uh, this didn't make any sense to me, because bearing in mind that the cathedral uh, can, can come on a completely uh, 
east-west orientation, which it does, of course, you know, um, east being, as we know, the place um, of the second coming, the rising of the sun uh, and the Christ's second coming, which is why churches are orientated uh, east-west. Um, why wouldn't most of the city have, it's the bishop's city, why wouldn't the most of the city have followed that same orientation? And any difficulties in landscape, any ground difficulties or whatever, uh, could have then just been dealt with on the periphery. It didn't make any sense. However, when we see this line, we suddenly begin to see there is a sense to it, because if it becomes a symbolic translocation of one city to another, which, as I said earlier on, is referenced in the poem and the letter by Peter de Bois, then we get a sense that this section of the gridiron part of the city is tilted in that direction as a response to the move from the old to the new. And albeit, you know, one could say, well, you're just guessing on that one. What, what, where's the evidence? Well, I think there's two pieces of evidence. One is the orientation itself, and the second one is um, the church of uh, St Edmunds. We can see on this next slide, uh, St Edmunds is the church in the top uh, right-hand corner. There are three churches in, um, in, in Salisbury, three parish churches initially built in Salisbury uh, in, in the 13th century. Um, and St Martin's, the one uh, right um, to the to directly uh, east of the cathedral, uh, and uh, St Thomas of Becket, directly north of the cathedral, uh, like the cathedral, both have uh, cardinal orientations. St Edmund's doesn't. Uh, it's not linked to a road. Sometimes you find churches, when they're linked to an urban fabric, begin to get locked into that urban fabric. Here it is pulled away from the road. There is no reason for it to, uh, to, to have this orientation, except for the fact that it's perpendicular to the orientation of the north uh, road that I've just shown you. We'll see that a little bit on the next slide. So those two bits of evidence to me suggested that that's a much more likely reason behind the, uh, the shifted grid of the, uh, of, of, of the, the gridiron plan. Um, what you can see on here is, is the, is the, are the basic elements um, of the church at the time. You can see the cathedral and the bishop's palace, the location of the, um, the, the two mendicant orders, the Grey Friars, of course, had a very close link at this point uh, via um, uh, Stephen Langton and, and Richard Poor to, uh, to, the to, to the cathedral chapter, along with people like Gross Test, who was the Bishop uh, of Lincoln. Uh, and the Blackfriars, the Dominicans, just opposite, or just over the river, um, but also various other uh, other elements. And if you look on the on the on the right hand side there, what you have are the three churches with the parish boundaries are brought into the city. Now, the critical thing here is that um, up until this this period, this beginning of the uh, 13th century, um, cities weren't or towns weren't really. Uh, understood as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an idea of a landscape. And cities became, the medieval city is beginning to emerge at this point. So most of the ceremonies, most of the processional rites of the small parish churches in the country uh, don't have an equivalence uh, within the city landscape. And so what's beginning to happen is that some of the traditions of the landscape are then being translocated into the city. And what we'll see is one of those key aspects the regation processions, which um, are, a, are a sort of a part of the annual um, ritual of uh, celebrating the church and resacralizing the ground, the sacred territory around that church, the parish. This is when the, historically they might go around with, with twigs and, and beat the bounds, which is both a, a, a recognition of making sure that everyone knew where the boundaries were, but also uh, a recognition that the land inside that is protected or, or at least um, uh, uh, looked after, um, both spiritually and physically, by by the church parishioners and the church itself. And so what we're seeing in these, uh, in, is in these different um, uh, parishes, what we'll see is a sense of how the bishop began, and the chapter began to establish a landscape of the city with three churches, three parish churches and a cathedral, but on these days began to be linked and established um, a, an iconography for the city as a whole. So 
if we go on to the next slide, what we what we can see is here. Okay, well, I was very interested. If we if we talk about the the grid, we can see that on the left there, um, and St Edmunds. I've drawn the perpendicular line through the church there. But then I was also, you know, I'm an architect. I'm interested in how things happen. So if I'd had the brief, um, okay, guys, we want something the same area as the um, roughly the same area as Old Serum, and um, you know, it's going to be centered on the cloister, uh, and. It, We've got this road coming down from north south, which is probably going to be the new way of doing things. Blah 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 blah. Uh, how do we then do it? Now, as I said to you before, St Martin's Church there was was pre predated the, uh, the, the the translocation of the city. It's the only church that was there prior to the move. And so, what I basically started to do was to try and say, okay, well, with the things that I have already, how can I begin to construct the close? Because strangely exactly in the same way that the um, that the grid of the city is not on the cardinal orientation, neither is the close. Again, very strange. Why, given the fact that you've got this carte blanche, this t tabula rasa, you can do anything you want, why would you put a close that's not on the cardinal orientation and is, is on a different orientation from the city? So, um, to cut a long story short, I, I managed through a series of stages to, to make an argument for how they would have structured as a sequence of events the, the, the location of the gates and the close wall as it stands in relation to these uh, two or three early moves. Uh, again, it's conjectural. Um, I have no proof apart from the fact that I now know that if I came along on tabula on this ground without anything there. I could have constructed it um, in a way that makes sense iconographically and symbolically, uh, which is again you know, what, what I said. I'm basically interested in. So um, here we can see then uh, the, the, the streets of, of the grid on the on the left there and the different names they had. I mean, a lot of the documents that I looked through. Uh, Salisbury is very well documented. Much of the work is in translation, some of the work isn't. You, know, you see I, 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 one of those documents I, I published as a translation. But a lot of them, including um, all of the uh, documents related to the church liturgy, are available um, pretty readily in Latin and in English translations. Uh, and so it was very easy to, to, to begin to, to construct a picture of uh, the city itself um, and uh, and the processional ordering that, that the bishop began uh, and the chapter began to sort of implement on the city as a whole and that's in a sense where we went through so just to sort of uh, look so if you've got the the city on the on the left there with the key buildings and the, and the streets I, mean, I, I, I worked out where all of the different uh, uh, trades were in the city whether the market square market crosses had any symbolic uh, situation in terms of this uh, uh, it wasn't that I immediately started with the regation processions. That is, in a sense, what emerged out of the research, looking at these documents, looking at the original Latin um, uh, use of uses that were available, um, that were, of course, written mostly for Old Serum. And like many documents at the time, um, they're quite sketchy. We have to understand about the medieval period. One of the reasons why there are no architectural treatises from the period is that the architecture was the representation. They didn't, they didn't feel the need to, to, to write about the representation that was in fact a representation that everyone could look at. What's the point of writing about something that's, that's doing its own, um, it's telling its own story? So um, what, what I began to do um, was to try to cre recreate the picture. And so the, the close, the detail of the close there uh, on the on the right of this particular slide is interesting for a number I'm just going to point out a couple of a couple of points the first thing is the churchyard wall so you can see that the close wall is the outer wall of that the uh, it's where I stop drawing all of the uh, all of the uh, the houses because these are all of the houses uh, of the canons of the of, of the chapter but there's also an inner uh, churchyard wall and that was nine feet high relatively high so what it means again and it's difficult to 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 sort of recognize this sometimes when you're just looking at plans and when something's not there anymore because over the period of years it was knocked down to sort of waist height and then 
um, at a certain point along with the bell tower, uh, it was taken away altogether. When it was nine feet high, of course, when you were coming into the cathedral or approaching the cathedral close, of course, the cathedral um, with its spire, of course, at the time we're going to see uh, it's pre the... Um, the stone spire, it had a timber spire which was smaller, which I've sort of sketched uh, on top of the cathedral model, just to show, to see its visibility. Uh, uh, and it's the, the uh, bell tower had a similar little timber, timber top on it as well. But what it means is that as you came close to the close wall, you couldn't then see the cathedral anymore. The wall's way above your head, so you can see it from a distance and as you come close, you, you lose the cathedral. And then you come through the cathedral, uh, through the close gates, and you see the cathedral with this nine-foot wall at the bottom. And as you approach the nine-foot wall, the cathedral disappears again. And then, as you go through the gate into the cathedral, it appears. So there are these sequences of, 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 of revealing and concealing the cathedral that you have to understand as a part of this processional movement. That the cathedral wasn't just there all the time, it was something that appeared and disappeared depending on your approaching and what time you approached it. The other thing on this is important is the bell tower. And the bell tower uh, had an early uh, clock in it uh, and also uh, told the time, as in bell tolling of the time. And the critical thing is, uh, uh, with the emergence of the civic nature of cities, um, the nature of uh, the, the three estates uh, the three estates is the way that people often talk about the medieval period. Um, the the, the uh, times, the, the, the people who prayed, the people who fought, and the people who worked. The people who, who prayed were obviously the clergy, the people who fought were the aristocracy, and the people who worked were the rest. And time, there was time for each of those. So there was a time for war, a time for prayer, and a time for work. And the way in which the bells told the time, if the, if um, for example, in the cycle of the day, in the offices of the day uh, of the different um, uh, rituals that are going on in the cathedral, that's not particularly useful for, a, for someone who's a leather maker. Um, and equally, uh, the time to do, make leather or to, to take the uh, leather out of the tannin, tanning uh, tanks is not the great time for a, a clergy. And so the relationship between the different types of time that begin to be um, uh, controlled in the city begins to be quite uh, quite a moot point. You know, there's people are pulling the clocks into the town halls because they want the time for work to take precedence over the time to prayer, uh, to pray. And so what we see here is uh, that the bell tower is situated more or less exactly halfway between the cloister, which is of course the representation of uh, Eden. Uh, of eternity, of the of nature in its eternity, and the gates of uh, the northern gate of the of the close. So there's this relationship of of time edging its way towards uh, the city, towards more mundane aspects of temporality, and the the bell tower becomes a part of that expression, part of that representation within the landscape itself. The bishop is 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 allowing some recognition of the time to work as a part of that structure. OK, so those are the two key things I want you to think about before we come into the into the processions themselves. And of course, if we look at the next slide, uh, what I've just described to you, this relationship of the appearance and disappearance of the cathedral is completely lost with this sort of picturesque setting that we have now. It's very beautiful, but it's not really the way in which the cathedral was designed to be seen or used within its urban landscape. This relationship between appearance and disappearance, between mundane and sacred landscapes, between temporality of the city and the temporality of, um, of the cathedral, and then the eternity as a part of the, the, uh, the, the temporality that en encompasses all of those different aspects of, of temporality, is structured spatially. That's what I'm saying. It's structured spatially within the close, and that's now gone, so, rather sadly. Okay, so this point here, so if you can imagine me putting all of this stuff together, this next, uh, this little bit of animation is uh, one of the ways in which uh, I used um, the information I had to uh, establish some of these processions. Um, it's very crude, it works on a topography and um, the street plan, and so the, the buildings are effectively blocked out with the churches uh, in 
orange or pink um, so that I can begin to see exactly what we're looking at. Uh, and then we followed through the processional routes from the regation um, that, that I'll come on to in a second. The idea being that if we come back to what I said at the beginning about the beating of the bounds, the big issue is that the uh, procession, an irrigation procession, will try and follow as closely as it can to the parish boundary of the particular church. Uh, and that's effectively what this particular um, uh, issue is working. And then what happened was, once we established during this route where we felt some of the key moments were, and it, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, we, this has the nine foot high wall in, so you get a, a little bit of a sense of that uh, of revealing and concealing that I talked about earlier. Uh, and we established um, uh, a couple of snapshots and then we put the photographs together, all these collages together. Now, this first collage of the uh, first regation uh, with the plan of uh, St. Thomas of Becket, it's important just to say a couple of words about these, these, uh, these collages. So the first thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, the time the, uh, it's, uh, the close wall was actually in timber, it hadn't yet been made in stone, and so that's what the indications are. It's a bit grand and, and maybe a bit expressionist, but nevertheless, um, these images uh, were, were put together along with uh, my students. So I had three students working with me on, on this. Um, Mohamed Agli worked mostly with the plans, uh, Jen Kuchoy worked mostly with the collages, and um, Nick Jones worked with the animations. And the three students took, and myself together pictured, created these pictures. And the idea of these um, collages is that they're like sports photographs. We're not looking at the, at the town at this point, at the city at this point. The city becomes a frame for the activity. And so uh, that's why you, you, it's not meant to be a realistic depiction of the city itself. It's more about the relationship of the procession to the churches. And so the steeples of those churches and the framing that the streets give to those is, is critical. So if we look at this first one here, this first one, the uh, on the first regation day, the chapter would have gathered in the cathedral, left the churchyard through the north gate of the close, and then had this view, this first view of the left here, of the, uh, the church of St Thomas of Becket, where they would then have headed uh, for first mass. Once the mass had been uh, done, and you can see that, the, that they couldn't, if they go north, directly north, they're going as close as they can on the street pattern to the uh, western bo parish boundary uh, and equally when they come out of the church if they follow as close as they can to the uh, to the bound to the boundary of the city they then come out of the church into the uh, the market square across the market square then down head south um, uh, south back towards the cathedral and then back into St Anne's Gate which is uh, the uh, the image we see on the next uh, on the next slide. Um, so so what we can see on this next slide is they've just come through St Anne's Gate and there is the nine foot churchyard wall uh, with the clock tower and the with its timber uh, spire and the cathedral with its um, completed cathedral but with this uh, smaller timber spire at the time. So you can see that the, this notion of, uh, of progression coming back and at the time, at the end of that day, they would have had a celebration in the market square with everyone in the, in the city, but the main parishioners of St Thomas of Becket would have focused on the day. Market sellers would have been a part of it. We don't know what other games there might have been, other celebrations. And then they come back into uh, the cathedral uh, via this uh, chur churchyard, uh, via the churchyard, uh, same churchyard gate they, they left uh, earlier on. Okay, so that's the first the first regation procession. The second regation procession effectively does that the other way around. So it goes out of the gate they came in and comes back the gate they, they came out of. So as they head out towards St Anne's Gate, here look, oh, we can see they can see they get a fantastic view of St Martin's. It's absolutely in line with the road on the inside and the road briefly for the, uh, the first section outside uh, of the close wall. So again, we have this notion of the destination, um, uh, where they're going to go for the regation procession, and then 
uh, you can see the dark dotted line on this plan on the left again, uh, on the left again here, uh, shows the parish boundary. And if they try to follow the parish boundary on the roads as close as they can, they go straight along, they divert away from St. Martin's and they come down towards the view uh, to St. Martin's for, for mass. Like they had mass in the previous day at St. Thomas of Becket's. Then, following that, they come out of the church, following the uh, eastern boundary as uh, close as they can, um, bearing in mind that it's a ditch at the time. This curved double dotted line is in fact the town ditch. Um, not particularly great place for a procession, so the nearest road to that would be the one indicated here on the plan, which they go up to as far as uh, Winchester Street, <coughs> where they turn, uh, turn west and head back towards the Market Square, where on the way, you can see on the, the top image of this next slide, there's two, two collages, um, it's the same procession, but two collages just on this slide. So this is the view just as they're coming out into the market square with Thomas a Becket's church there, uh, the cathedral off to the, off to the left. So they're building on yesterday's regation procession. So the first regation procession, the only church that was seen was St. Thomas a Becket's. Uh, this this day, you come out, you see St Martin's, you have Mass in St Martin's, then on the way back, go through the Market Square again, big party again, and then back through down into uh, Minster Street, down into, back into the cathedral, and the bottom image there is the approach coming back towards uh, the cathedral with uh, the clock tower and the... Um, spire of the cathedral beyond. Again, this notion, trying to create this notion of disclosure and... Um, uh, and uh, you know the opening and closing of views really uh, that, that form a part of this procession ordering the orientation that you get from seeing something and then being diverted on a path around the, the, the city which in itself becomes a metaphor for Christian life the path the path taken is not necessarily you know you don't see it and go on it you have to you know life is difficult life has its own twists and turns so this becomes a metaphor for that as well. This is not like Renaissance planning, where we get vistas. We must not understand it in that way. This is a medieval sense of order, which is much, much more embedded in this processional revealing and concealing, the crossing of boundaries, the remaking of boundaries through their transgression, which is a part of this processional order. OK, so again, two, two processions here, you know, some might argue uh, it's a bit random. It's really this third one. When I, when I realised that this third one lined up with the wall of the uh, with the wall of the close, for me that was it. There was no question that the three churches had a processional order. What we just, there's almost nothing written about this particular third regation procession. The the earlier two processions talk about the reversal of gates and entry d departure and re-entry into the close. Um, pro probably written more directly for. Uh, for Old Sarum than for than for for Salisbury, but nevertheless uh, translatable very clearly as you've seen. Um, so the third one, the third gate, very likely the third gate, the third church. So if you come out of the south of the cathedral, close as suggested to the third gate, and then you turn the corner, which is what's indicated in this first uh, collage, and you look back up towards the church, there you can see in the distance framed. Uh, by this road, the steeple of St Edmunds, which is the church, as you remember, right at the beginning, is reorientated on this axis of the grid uh, that leads us back up to Old Sarum. So what happens with the path here? So my guess is they probably um, did the following. In order to get over to the uh, to the f eastern part of the town, for the eastern boundary, they, for, for to, to get into the uh, parish of St Edmunds, they probably would have turned at St Anne's Gate and then seen St Martin's again. So they've seen the, the church from the day before. But instead of then going towards St Martin's, they turn north and then head up uh, as close as they can again to the, uh, to the town's ditch, which is the edge of the parish, up towards St Edmunds, where they have the mass. Then they come out, go along the, the, the northernmost street of the city until they come to the... Uh, westernmost street of the city which is the uh, delineus again the, the parish boundary is actually the center of the river here but they go across as far as they can and then they head south and when they head south they see the church of thomas a becket here this is this is what happens when they turn south 
So they've seen St. Martin's, they've been to St. Edmund's, and now they've gone past. So they're coming past um, St. Thomas of Becket with, as you can see, the, the cathedral minster in the background. So the orientation of homecoming. And of course, once they've done this, they then come through into the marketplace, big celebration again, and then back down Minster Street and into and into the cloister. Right, so what have you done? They've mapped out over the three days the full boundary of the city. The, in, in order to get to St. Edmund's Parish, effectively, this last brigation procession maps out as close as you can on the edges the, the, the boundary of the city itself. So the city itself, after the three, the, the, on the third, of, uh, the third of the churches, becomes also um, the, the, the boundary of the city itself. So the three regation processions lead up to the Feast of the Ascension, which is on the following day, which is obviously the, the date at which uh, Christ ascended uh, to heaven. And in this one, the, the, the procession is back into the rarefied aspect of inside the close and inside the churchyard. It's in the most sacred area. And it comes, it starts at the altar, comes out of the west portal, goes around the north side of the church, right round the outside, comes back into the cloister, goes around the cloister and then back out and in and then back in through the west portal. And what's important, you know, what we begin to get an understanding is if all of these movements were really significant, then the photograph on the left of Salisbury's Lady Chapel, which shows these sort of um, incidental views that aren't framed in a sort of a Renaissance symmetry, become much more evocative of the natural world which, which the representation of the cathedral is, this notion of a, of a, of a, of a frozen nature, of a, an art, a nature as artifice, this world of, um, of the church as heavenly Jerusalem, as a representation of eternity, becomes significant again. So maybe it also, understanding this notion of movement, also suggests the way we should start looking at the architecture. And then just briefly looking at then, you know, the, the west portal here is the symbolic portal, not the portal that's usually used for entrance and exits in the church. It's a representation historically of the day of judgment and consequently used predominantly for celebrations like these processions. And this woodcut on the left is interesting because it's it's from a, 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 a 16th century woodcut and it describes um, links into the descriptions in the uh, earlier 13th century uh, liturgi liturgical documents that talk about the dragon on the Feast of the Ascension here in the centre, which is, has a broken tail. They call it a dragon banner, but it very likely in many of these processions was a, was a, was a, like a big sculpture or, or a um, puppet or something with um, the banner of um, the lion, a uh, representation of St Mark, who, uh, again, for uh, regation, is, has a symbolic relation to, 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 to regation. So what you can see here is, is a description for the, for the church as to how they should set up the processions with these strange donut looking things being the tonsure, the haircuts of, of the various clergy with the thersifers and various things. So the idea was on the previous three days, there was some image of the dragon representing untamed nature walking around and being processed and, and held around the centre of the city and it's only in the Feast of Ascension that the dragon defeated by, uh, by Christ's resurrection, um, you know, nature defeated by, by Christ's resurrection, that the dragon itself himself becomes, uh, becomes uh, broken. And so what's very interesting historically is that these dragons Often uh, Van Gennep, in his, in his, in his fantastic work, um, he's an anthropologist, uh, talks about how that in many parts of Europe the dragon, uh, iconography of the dragon, gets translated into the iconography of the giant. And of course we have the giant and, and hobnob, hobnob in Salisbury. So, uh, but of course all of this really, all of this differentiation, this, this transformation, does not look like, it does not look like, it doesn't fit into the world that we have currently um, for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the cathedral. And it's a shame, because if we look at the, the, this sort of picturesque view from the side or you know, another view of the West Front, um, it's an extraordinary building designed to be used more theatrically. Even this facade, you can't see it on here, on this here, but the sculptures, the relatively later uh, late sculptures added, um, cover up holes in the facade where the choir sat behind. And so consequently, in some of these processions, as, you were, as the processions approached the cathedral, 
the choir, the cathedral itself was singing to the approaching uh, processions. And when they came in, they went through this, they could hear the cathedral, the cathedral choir singing outside the cathedral. Then when they went through the vestibule, it goes quiet. And then inside, the voice comes up again. It's extraordinary. This notion of boundaries being transgressed and constantly crossed and remade is extraordinary and beautiful. Um, but we don't see it so much uh, anymore. So the next few slides are just a very quick view of, 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 of the, Fro the Florentine festivals. So, because the fact that Salisbury's lost this, um, this tradition doesn't mean that it's um, beyond, uh, beyond the it's beyond the, the realms of possibility that it could be resurrected in some shape or way or form. So in, in Florence, since the 13th century, and it's still going on every year on the 24th of June, the Feast of San Giovanni, which is their, their patron saint, uh, there's a festival, and it combines civic pride, piety, sporting prowess, violence, commerce, throughout the civic centre, throughout the city centre. And as people dress up, there are, as you can see in this photograph here, there's police, tourists, all mixed together. Um, and you know, you can see from the from the video, you know, there's a sort of sense of of communality, of spectacle. Um, people take it seriously, but also it's possible to have fun and to engage in commerce. And as you can see here, you know, we have flag wavers, tourists, photographers, um, priests civic dignitaries, um, uh, musicians, all coming together, including a whole pile of fighters who, uh, as you can see in this, uh, this slide on the Calcio Storico, they fight in this most brutal football match you, you, you'd ever wish to, to, to see. Um, and it's a time when these, these outsiders, these uh, rugged, um, fighting, brutal, youngsters, the sort of youth, the quintessential sort of uh, youth, uh, wayward youth of the city, become the heroes for a day, like festival. There's this inversion of order, and so the things that were normally uh, shunned and, and kept quiet suddenly become the, the centre of attention. And this, this uh, reversal of, of, of attitude has is, is always been a part of the civic ordering of the city. Um, and the architecture, you can see in these two slides, this is the, a couple of quick slides of the uh, Michalozzo uh, courtyard in the Palazzo Vecchio, where here you can see the dignitaries are waiting to, to gather before they, they, they go, um, uh, go up to the cathedral to give uh, a gift of candles. And these, these guys here were dressed up with the feather, feather hats are the people holding the candles that are going to be given by the civic and civic authorities to the church symbolically for another year. But there's no one stopping anyone doing anything. I could walk in the middle of here. The architecture plays its role. These old buildings that have this extraordinary richness in thresholds and the ability to divide space in a, in a very simple way without police cordons still works. Um, so here, so we're back in Salisbury now. We're back in Salisbury, and this is, um, I took these photographs, I think it was in um, 2010, St. George's Day procession. And this, for me, is the beginnings of something, the beginnings of a possibility. Albeit it's a very small event, Giant and Hobnob were still at this point allowed uh, out of their home in the, uh, in, in the museum. But as we can see here, musicians, dancers, uh, spectators, uh, fancy dress, uh, normal accoutrements of a, of a fair, you know, the, the tacky goods that come along with the highly skilled craft, uh, craft goods that, that are sold in these, in these days historically when the traders of the town can bring their benches out into the street and begin to sell, it, to, sell to these, the large numbers of people who've come to, to gather to, to watch the fair. And, and in 2010, we had the mayor as well. The mayor and the other civic dignitaries, the, 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 the various um, roles of the city, the city council, and that this very small procession, albeit very small, went around the town hall square. And um, as you can see here, you know, there's a sort of sense that the fancy dress uh, opens up the, the, 
the livery of the Civic Council to a certain amount of jest. It can be funny. This is fancy dress. It's so the sense again of of propriety, of negotiation, of what this you know. These are the people who run the city during the year. Come out and they engage like uh, in the medieval period when the when the church. Um, uh, the, the, the canons of the church came into the city. Here the civic dignitaries are coming out, talking to people, watching, judging the various um, uh, fancy dress uh, and other events that, that go on. And this is, this is important. And we see the various institutions that are represented here, you know, the institutions of the city, the police, uh, theatres. What was missing was the church. And not only the church, but all of the other churches of the city. Because even in the medieval period, um, you know, we like to think of them as bigoted. And yes, the, you know, pogroms happened, uh, extraordinary, um, uh, you know, witch hunts. I'm not for one moment defending it as, as the most pure and perfect time. But nevertheless, uh, even in Christian festivals, like we see even, saw in the 20th century in places like you know, multicultural cities uh, in, on the Mediterranean, like Alexandria. And all of the different faiths got involved, even if it wasn't their particular saint was being celebrated. Come, this is an opportunity for the cities to come together, to engage. And you can see that, whereas in, 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 in Florence, the, the city was completely packed and buzzing, here, it just didn't quite have the, the gravity, the mass of people, to make it feel like it could feel. And that was partly because... In those in that year, um, to the north, uh, to the north of the city, um, y you know there was there was a whole pile of separate events going on um, going on up in Hudson's Field, where there was a music festival, children's things, you know, all of these events, all of these bouncy castles and stuff happening two kilometres north of the city, away from where all of this civic agonistic. Uh, confrontation, negotiation, really interesting um, symbolic uh, city-making tasks going on is is happening, the, the entertainment part of it is sort of shifted to the north when in fact there's a perfectly good space by the cathedral here where this could have happened. Now, I, you know, I know since 2010 there have been events going on in uh, in the close for various occasions but it seems to me that the city yet hasn't got quite got to grips with the possibilities for coming together in a united way, in a negotiated way, to say, you know, well, this is what this festival means for me, this is what it means for me, maybe two different things, but actually coming together at the same time and celebrating on that same time gives you the identity of the richness of the city. So, for example, still the most extraordinary surviving processional route in, in Salisbury Cathedral, the, the advent the, uh, from darkness to light, where one voice and one candle begins to multiply over the period of the, of the mass. And in the end, the whole cathedral is lit up by candles and people. It's extraordinary. It is one of the most moving experiences you could ever have in a cathedral because it's lit in a way that's sympathetic to the building. It's lit in a way that the building was supposed to be lit. It's full of people in a way that the building was supposed to be full of people. Allowing for density, uh, densities of groups of people, but processions going on at the same time. Fantastic. Why couldn't something like that begin to engage in, uh, in an evening scenario, in the day when there's something else going on, and that the civic dignitaries and the church dignitaries come together? Because when I look at this image, and this is my final image, of here, the dragon, the Salisbury dragon, you know, remade by children. Um, you know, this is the dragon of, of the regation procession, remade in a, in a funny way, in an ironic way, with, you know, the, the Morris dancing band behind, the, the flags of patriotism, the civic, the, the, the robes of civic governance, and this sort of strange, beautiful dragon in the front. And this is what a festival is about. And this is where I think, given the foundations of Salisbury are built on a processional world, its future is also there. That it only would take, it would only take the civic governance of all of the people of the city to come together on a day when people would then know every year 
that's the day I'm going to go to Salisbury. That's the day when the city comes alive in a way that all of the things that go behind, go on behind closed doors for the rest of the year, come out into the street and display themselves and have some sort of relationship. This is how you make a city. And this is the way Salisbury should think about remaking itself in the 21st century. Yeah.